It's a joy to be here and to share on this wonderful topic with you at this conference. I, lo I loved the topic, the topic immediately when I saw it. And I was processing that as far as a church conference goes because we are here now sort of inwardly focused. We're looking at uh, the actual uh, edifying of the saints. And I thought about how really the, the church and the scriptures is uh, seen to have three different purposes. Uh, so a threefold purpose, really. We are here and we exist as a church of Jesus Christ to exalt Christ and to edify the saints and then also to evangelize the lost. That's our purpose. But when you think about it, how are we going to exalt Christ or evangelize the lost unless we have amongst ourselves a, a healthy oneness um, like we are seeking to you know, foster in ourselves in a conference like this? So, yeah, you know, uh, where the one and others are walking in oneness as we seek to do in this conference, there it will be well with our worship and with our witness. Amen? Amen. So, yes, we've got really um, no chance of being a, a worshipping church or a witnessing church unless we are walking in oneness. So it's a, it's a really good topic for us this morning to be focused on in a church conference, oneness. And thank you, Andrew, for sharing with us already. And as, he, as I sat there and listened, I said, you know, as we talk about oneness, you're going to hear a few things again and again because there are, uh, you know, truths that relate to that. It doesn't matter which angle you come from it, uh, come at it from. But, you know, as I, as, as I arrive here this morning and just walk into Christ Baptist Church and you know, start to see familiar faces and some you know, meeting some new folk. You know, one, one, one senses that swelling of your heart as you, you come to sort of be struck again by, with a heightened sense of, of how great the love of God is for his children. I mean, it's 10 years or more. It's actually probably more like 12 years since we were around here. And you know, God has kept us. And it's this God who... Who, who, who loves us with, a, with an undying love. A God who we see has chosen us before even the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and love. And he's, in spite of seeing how, you know, we were rebels and we came into this world dead in our transgressions and sins and going our own way uh, in disobedience and really objects of wrath because of his great love for us. Rich in mercy, he made us alive in Christ. And Paul prays that we would be able to grasp together with all the saints the dimensions of this love that is surpassing knowledge. <laughs> That's the kind of love that we enjoy from the heart of our Father who is in heaven as his children. It's a, it's a glorious and a wonderful love. Some have tried to describe it. It's impossible. I think of it, a particular hymn. Perhaps you're familiar with it. O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, pure. Uh, and, and, and he tries to, in that hymn, sort of in a poetical way, uh, describe the greatness of this love. He says, you know, if, if, if all the ocean... Do you know what the ocean is up here? <laughs> I mean, we traveled like for three days, so I'm wondering if you do to get you. If that, was, if that sea was ink, all that water was ink, and you looked at the sky, the infinite sky, and you said, that was all paper. And then you took every stick on this whole earth, and that was a pen. And you put that pen into the hand of every person in this whole world, the billions that there are. And they began to write and drain that ink supply dry with writing the love of God on the sky. And the hymn writer says, you know, that, that, that scroll could not contain the whole of the love of God. It's, it's, it's vast. It's like John says, and we should exclaim with him. And sometimes it hits us more than others, like 
sometimes like when I come to a place like this, it hits me again in a, in, a, in a kind of way that grips me, that God loves us as his children to the point we say, oh, the, uh, 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 the manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And that's the love with which he loves us. It's glorious. And as we come to this text this morning, and we see, as we, and I invite you to open your Bible now to, uh, to, to Matthew chapter 18. Sorry, in all the you know, panic there, I forgot my Bible. So let me just uh, get that. Uh, uh, I'm getting so weary of my small little Bible. The brothers, the, the students will know. Pastor Rob, he only uses small Bibles. So, but you know what? In the last years, my eyes have dimmed a bit. And so I actually like to just write my stuff out from what I'm going to use on my manuscript. But, yeah, this love of God that's uh, in this, in, in, and, and we come to our text here. And is it any wonder then that a God who loves his children so much? would then say this in verse 10 of chapter 18. And our text is from 10 to 14. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. That's the God that loves us to the extent that we are saying. And we say, is it any wonder then that Jesus should tell his disciples and us today too, here in this place, see that you do not look down? The context of, these, of this text is interesting and we should think about it from uh, the starting as we go into it. We're going to read up to uh, uh, verse 14 as well, but just before we do that, think about the context of those words. I mean, uh, Jesus is here really giving a, a sermon, a teaching, an instruction to his disciples. And it's one that we could say befits a conference like this because he's teaching them about how to live together in the kingdom as fellow citizens, how to live together in the family of God as siblings uh, with one another, children of God together, how to get along. And, yeah, the, the whole thing starts with them sort of, you know, in this kind of wrangling about who's the greatest. So it's a, it's a timely word that Jesus is giving here as he instructs in uh, Matthew chapter 18 uh, his, his disciples, probably in the house of Peter, and he's got this child there uh, with him as a sort of an object lesson. And he's giving this admonition to them. See that you do not, you know, look down on any one of these little ones. Because what was going on with them, these disciples, you'll recall, is that they were bickering about these things and who was going to be first, who was going to be the greatest, who had the most status around here and who was going to be superior in rank even in the kingdom now and in the kingdom that he would bring in, in his coming. And yeah, who was, who was going to be the most spiritual? Who's, who's the most spiritual here um, among them? And all these sorts of prideful kinds of expressions uh, that, that was coming out of their ego-centered and uh, pride-inflated hearts. Um, and it was quite the opposite to what Jesus was trying to say and teach them and live out by example in front of them of being you know, like this child uh, in humility. And so that's why in verse 4, uh, sorry, 14, uh, he, 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 he comes to say this uh, in this way. And even back in verse 4, actually, he said, whoever humbles himself like a child uh, will be the one who's greatest in the kingdom. So in response to all the, the bickering from verse 1 of who's the greatest, he moves on. Jesus, you know, says what he says. Here in, in, in our text now, from verse 10 to verse 14, not as a sort of an off-the-cuff 
uh, sort of statement without a context, but rather it's a timely word on a particular topic. And, you know, it aligns with our topic today because the topic in this session is do not judge but build up one another. I don't know if you noticed that in your program, but that is the topic before us this morning. Do not judge but build up one another. And so, yes, we're going to see today the importance of his children building up one another and the sinfulness on the other side of his children being judgmental of one another. And so let's read the, the rest of the text. He says, you know, see you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of of my father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wandered away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look to the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I'll tell you the truth. He is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. And so we're going to see from this text here before us this morning, really break it in two and see, first of all, a rebuke, really, to to his disciples and to us here for showing contempt to one of these little ones. And then secondly, we'll look at reasons for showing care and concern for each of these little ones. And so, yeah, we begin here, first of all, by looking at what Jesus says as he rebukes, and it's a scathing rebuke in verse 10, of anyone who would show contempt, anyone who would show contempt to one of these little ones, instead of care, Instead of concern. So as we zoom into verse 10, notice that rebuke. And it's to do with looking down, despising. And it's little ones. Just to begin and make sure we understand that. Little ones. It's not little children as in just children. It was that in the beginning of this chapter as he brought that little child and may stand amongst them. But, uh, you know, things have moved on contextually and it's, Jesus has become more concerned now that we understand that all who are in the kingdom are like and to be like little children. In fact, you won't even enter the kingdom of God unless, he says, you become like a little child, like this little child. And so, yeah, Trust that you are in the kingdom, having come in like a little child, just simply weak, dependent in your sin, realizing you can do nothing, but trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his free and full gift to you of salvation by his finished work alone. And see yourself before God in that absolutely helpless state. You come into the kingdom like a little child. But little ones here, folks, are little one another's, us here today. We are the little one another's that Jesus is ultimately referring to when he says, see to it that you do not look down on one of these little one another's. But notice, more specifically, the command, do not look down on one of these little ones. And look down, interestingly, uh, in, in the Greek Language, as you look at it, it's not actually look, it's think down. The word is think before it's look. And thinking happens before we look anywhere. Amen? The thought that someone else is beneath you or me will only surface in viewing once we have thought about them that way. And so what Jesus is rebuking here in verse 10 as he gives us the scathing rebuke for any such thing 
to his disciples and us is to, you know, hitting hard at this thought of viewing someone like that. Looking down, downward. Our, our subject is about do not judge. Folks, judging has got to do with thinking down, thinking down. Thinking down and judging them, that other person, as you think about them, as inferior and not worth my care, my interest. That's how Jesus is seeing things happen here amongst his disciples. But it happened right there, at the very beginning, with these followers of Jesus. We are in danger ourselves. He's talking about that kind of thing of being with contempt, with scorn, with disdain, with, to despise and to be condescending towards another Christian. Even to be rude, perhaps. Uncaring, unhelpful, hateful. I think you know, to think of, of, of someone in, with, with an egotistical pride. That we are somehow better than them. To see others in a way that we look down on them as worth less than ourselves, somehow less significant or even insignificant, undeserving of our attention, our care, our trouble, our nurturing, our respect. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Being judgmental, yeah, being nitpickers instead of nurturers in the kingdom. Nobody wants to come into the church where the church people are nitpicking for this, that, and the next thing. The church needs to be a place rather of nurturing one another. And so we do see that at the bottom of this, and our brother Andrew has already, you know, given us a, about pride. And I also unavoidably say, pride is at the bottom of this. Amen? If you're going to talk about oneness, all day, we're going to have to talk a lot about pride because the big obstacle, as Andrew said, to oneness is pride. It's pride in our own ethnicity. It's a pride in our own spirituality. It comes out in all kinds of forms, but it's this thing that makes us and allows us to stand up here and look down at somebody else at where they are. And so we need to see that again and again, and we will have to today. And so, yes, you know, he starts with this, notice the word see. See that you do not look down on, on these little ones. But that first word there, see, is a key to this. I mean, we're talking now about Jesus not just sort of mentioning sort of, you know, sort of, you know, sort of, Oh, so by the way, kind of, but I forgot to mention it. No, this is, this is emphatic. He is really saying it like this. See to it. I mean, you know, you, you, you saying to your child, you know, see that you don't let that milk boil over. When, let's say it like this. You, don't let the milk boil over. <laughs> no, you, if, you, if you really don't want to let the milk boil over, you say, see to it that you don't let the milk boil over. Amen? That's what Jesus is saying here. It's a lot more strict, a lot more forceful when we say it like that. And there's that emph emphatic kind of stronger admonition that Jesus is giving here. There's a passion behind this as we hear him say, see to it. It's extremely serious, this. When we're talking about oneness, we're talking about something extremely serious, something that will completely uh, neutralize and cause oneness to be impossible. Extremely serious business. He actually says, we could say, don't you dare ever look down on a single one of these little ones. That's the feeling we should be getting as we listen to this. That's the sense of what Jesus is saying. Very serious matter. And so here's Jesus giving this prohibition. And as we hear him express it with such emphasis, with such, you know, strong admonition, you know, like that, we think about how, first of all, 
encouragingly, while we are small little ones and others, we have a very great champion who's on our side, looking after us. And, and he is taking a very serious view at anyone who is looking down upon any of us, thinking down upon any of us. I mean, think about it. Cain looked down on Abel. And God somehow cursed him. Back in Genesis 4. Miriam and Aaron, they despised, they looked down on Moses. And she broke out in leprosy. There's a guy in 3 John called Diotrephes, who was one of these, I'm the greatest kind of people. And he, yeah, made havoc in that church. And, you know, John just rebuked him publicly for that. So we've got, a, we've got a champion on our side who's looking after us. But he takes a very strong view at this. So, yes, let's remember that when we see, that what we see here is something that God really hates. What we're talking about, this judgmental kind of looking down, thinking down, despising behavior that Jesus is rebuking here. So we're seeing, first of all, a very a rebuke for showing contempt. The immediately preceding context, you know, will also alert us to just how serious a matter this is. And it would be, you know, there that Jesus says, you know, if anyone's going to be putting a stumbling block, because this is also putting a stumbling block, calling, causing somebody to sin when you despise them and judge them this way. Better for you to just take your eye that looks down that way and take it out rather than be thrown into the eternal fire with two eyes. And he's talking about the world there. But yes, this is a serious business, folks. It's a serious business that we're seeing. Rather go to heaven with missing eyes and not looking down eyes than be thrown into the fire. So Jesus is warning us here, his disciples and us too, in no uncertain terms, folks. And if they needed that warning, his disciples, then there and then we need it here too. Amen? I would imagine. Because our hearts are no different to his disciples. If we're honest with ourselves, no different we need to hear the warning like they needed to hear the warning. We have like a soul connection with the, those disciples in the sense of, you know, quarreling about who's greatest, if not outwardly, inwardly, and all of that. And, uh, yeah, well, we have a wonderful local church here, and it's a beautiful place, and, you know, we, 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 we live together in beautiful harmony. At the same time, we're not above this, any one of us. So we need to hear it again, perhaps, and even perhaps deserve some of the sting of this scathing rebuke from Jesus' mouth again this morning. Now you might say, well, I can't think of anybody that I'm looking down on in this kind of a despising, condescending, kind of judging way. Nobody in this church, nobody that I can immediately think of that I'm despising in God's kingdom, and I, yeah, I do hope that's true, but let's think about some examples of how we can end up despising each other and looking down instead of looking out for them, looking down on them. It's a subtle thing, this. It's a subtle thing that we need to be careful about. And we can be subtly insensitive, for example, to the needs of other Christians you know, in a way, that's what Jesus is talking about here. You know, living our own lives, living in our own little world, our own little bubble, not caring about anyone else really, what they need, what's going on in their lives. Even in our own little church family, uh, it can happen. Obviously, we, we, we're limited. We're not available or able to you know, see every person's need met. And that's not the point. It's about the heart, though. The heart. How are we at that level? 
Remember, this is a thinking that Jesus is actually confronting here more. But it works out in, and manifests in action. So that's a question we need to ask ourselves about this. You know, um, are you very quick to make maybe a deposit in the plate, but very slow to make a visit to the person in need? So, yeah, Jesus is warning us um, in this text. We have needs in a church like this, many needs, even though it's a wonderful family, and it is a wonderful family to be a part of. But, uh, yeah, there are many needs that, uh, you know, sometimes there's a sense that everyone's okay in a place like this. But, yeah, really needs of rise. People need friendship. They need counseling. They need sometimes confronting even for their sin in their lives. And yeah, we need to be able to come and to be available to people in that way. Many examples of this, even in our marriages. Think about it, husbands, our wives, you know, get the sense very quickly from us if we should be looking down or thinking down on them. And we need a text like this to remind us. This is a practical text this morning. It actually tackles us as to this in our lives. And we'll go to go on to see some, you know, reasons for rather, you know, showing concern and care and contempt. But think about it now. You know, sometimes we you know, need to just forego our own little program for the day to see to something that our wives need urgently from us instead. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you guys know about the sea and surfing and all that, but, you know, Tracy and I, we're both surfers down there at the beach, and we ride those things called waves on things called surfboards <laughs> down on that uh, other planet down there. But, you know, when I was busy preparing this, you know, she ran into the rocks with her surfboard and it got an injury. I was like, yeah, you know, this passage made me fix that surfboard today (laughs) for her, rather than probably what would have happened sometime later. It would have maybe taken a few days. But no, it was like, hey, if you, you know, are caring instead of, Contempt, showing contempt, but showing care and concern. If I'm looking out for her instead of down on her, I'll fix that thing now. And it kind of got me off my tail end and got me doing the job for her. I don't want to be like that. I want to be like this. And so, yeah, this is a practical thing, you know. In the same way, wives, you know, think about it. How you can perhaps subtly become indifferent to the needs of your husband and, you know, take them for granted a bit falling into the trap of pride in that way, fail to respect them as you should, as the Bible says. You know, you can wash his socks and, you know, make his food, but while you're there with your friends on Wednesday, you talk in a way that is derogatory about him, perhaps. Fathers too, don't exasperate your children. And children, I mean, this is talking about your parents as little ones, obey them, honor them. And even if we're older children, let's obey and honor our parents. They are our little ones too in this text. And so, yeah, let's even go outside the home. And there are many ways in which we can fall and fail uh, to apply this in the church. And I think particularly as we talk about judging, folks, that, um, yeah, you know, consider the problem of us being like people who are out on speck patrol, you know, looking for little specks in one another's eyes, a speck in another's eyes, while we perhaps have two big logs or beams sticking out of ours. Let's be careful not to be inspectors judging each other in the church. 
That would be in contravention to this, what Jesus is warning us so strongly to be careful of. Don't be an inspector who has not looked at your own self. And you're looking, you're walking around. Your, your, your thing about coming to church is to see who's breaking your rules and nitpicking everybody and everything. Be careful of that, you know. And then showing favoritism, perhaps. It's easy to become quite cliquey in the church. You know, we, we like to stick like birds of a feather, stick together. And there's obviously a way that that happens, but let's be careful of this as we do gravitate to our own kind. In our minds, we may be formulating subtly like when we do that, a kind of thinking about others outside of our little clique as being unacceptable. And slowly rifts happen and there becomes these kind of you know, divisions and uh, separations and cliques in a church. And as Andrew said, you know, we're a church, uh, I must say, when I think about it, I've been to quite a few different churches along the way. Uh, this is one of the most diverse churches that I've ever been in. And I uh, praise the Lord for that. But it comes with its challenges. Amen? It comes with its challenges. And so let's be careful of that favoritism and showing favoritism and forming little groups and cliques. Let's be careful that we don't fail to keep the second of the two great commands to love one another. That would be to look down on one of these little ones. And let's consider, because Jesus is going to talk about uh, that in the discourse, that you know, faithful are the wounds of a friend too. Deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. An open rebuke is better than love concealed. If, if anyone in the fellowship is, you know, apparently needing a rebuke, and um, let's not then, in a way, despise them, as Jesus is saying, do not despise one of these little ones. Don't despise them and say, you know, I don't want to get involved with that situation, you know, and despise them and say, I don't want to judge lest I be judged. And we take that kind of judging, do not judge, out of its context and misconstrue the meaning of that and misunderstand that completely. But here in the church, we do need to judge each other in a certain way. And when it comes to expel the immoral brother, there's a, there's a place for judging. So this is about do not judge. Yes, but there are times when, you know, we need to look at what's going on, perhaps in another situation where we see um, somebody in an obvious sin that everybody can see that's obviously in contravention to the scriptures and the will of God and we need to go to that person otherwise we will be showing you know contempt for them in the sense of this but yeah one thing is for certain no matter how many examples we can put out here this morning of this God hates every example of looking down on one another and yeah instead of our role as his children toward one another, uh, of doing that, we should think about, and our brother brought out Philippians 2, but I want to you know, pick up on that because Philippians 2 says it so well. And this is how I really want to try to leave it in your minds because this is a looking down. But in Philippians 2, he says, each of you should look out for the interests of others. And Look out for the interests of others, not down. And I'll read that whole section, but there's a beautiful section. Make my joy complete, it says, by being like-minded. You know, being in your oneness like this. Looking out for the interests of others. Not looking down on others. Let your attitude be like that of Christ. And he tells us how Christ is like that. But I want to come to the rest of this text and look at that. And so, yes, this morning, let's begin this morning by receiving that scathing rebuke that Jesus gave his disciples and he gives his church and he gives us this morning at Christ Baptist Church. It's a scathing rebu rebuke for showing contempt for one another. 
But let's come to now the second side of this. Let's always be looking out and never be looking down on one another. And how are we going to be motivated to do that? And that brings us to some reasons, some motivations for how we're going to be able to do that. And that comes to us in the rest of the text before us this morning. So now, we move from rebuke for showing contempt to reasons for showing concern and care. That's secondly, out of the two parts this morning in this session. So reasons for showing contempt. And there are three here that we should look at for being ever helping and never harming of each other. Ponder first then in verse 10 and the second half of this verse now um, when Jesus goes on immediately to say, For I tell you that their angels in heaven, these little ones, angels in heaven, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And so firstly then, And the first reason here this morning is this, that we should never contravene what Jesus is saying here, but rather be caring, is that the angels care for these little ones. The angels care for these little ones. The care of the angels. Notice that word for right at the beginning of the verse, or of the next part of the verse, because it's connecting. It's connecting In other words, this is why we should always look out for rather than down on every single one of these little ones of mine. For the angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. And what a totally amazing remedy that is. Amen? If you think about it. I mean, did you consider as you saw your brother or sister uh, as as you entered here this morning perhaps, did you, did, you, did you see them in this way this morning? I would assume probably you didn't, because we don't see this with our physical eyes. But with the eyes of faith, we do need to be reminded of this reality that this text brings before us. Because literally, folks, and the study of Scripture bears this out beyond this text, but we don't need to just, just look at it here and see that there are hosts of angels who are in heaven, continually gazing upon the face of the Father and waiting at the ready to do his bidding for him. And and, and that bidding, much of that bidding, is to take care of these little ones, these little one and others, us. So there are these angelic servants who are there right now. now. Consider this. Put it in your thinking. And they're ready to be dispatched by God from his presence with a mission to take care of us. That's a remedy if ever there was one. In my thinking at least. It's mind-blowing to think about that as a reason and a motivation for never allowing ourselves to fall prey to this kind of contempt. But seeing how they care for us and being really in the same way. How do they care for us, these angels? Well, you know, in various and sundry ways. You know, I was just recently studying in, 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 uh, in First Kings, and we see there about um, e- e- Elijah and how he's on the run from, you know, uh, Carmel to Horeb. And there an angel comes, and he feeds him and gives him something to drink twice in that text. Angels, an angel was gazing on the face of the Father as Elijah became weary and he was so discouraged and he had, you know, the need to really stop out of depletion. And the angel said, off you go. Elijah needs some water and drink, some, some, eat, some food and drink. We constantly face battles, folks, too, in our Christian lives as children of God. From within and from without. 
We're up against Satan and his minions working against us with subtle schemes. He's a crafty servant, serpent. And, you know, he's attacking us. We're not unaware of his schemes. But as the children of God, we need to be aware that there are these angels in heaven gazing upon the face of your Father, Jesus says. And they are ready um, and in the onslaught of the enemy upon us to assist us. Are you going to despise or are you going to defer when you think about that regarding your brother or sister? We need to think about how these angels in heaven help us in the daily battle from within with the flesh that is constantly waging war. There's conflict between the flesh and the spirit in each of us. And, you know, that's why these angels are there. And it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the spiritual realm that this battle goes on uh, in, our, in our lives. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual battle. And you know, there's this world system around us that is also the, 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 the principalities and powers in the dark uh, spiritual realms. And it's being waged there between the angels on behalf of God's children in you know, various fronts that we cannot even see in our lives, even now. And you think about that passage in Daniel chapter 9, for example. And the prophet Daniel was there, he was weary, and we are told that the angel came, dispatched from the Father, to strengthen him and to give him encouragement and a revelation. We read of that revelation in that chapter. We also read there that there was this prince of Persia, this demon, who, you know, he was in a battle with. And then another angel was dispatched. I think the first one was Gabriel. The first, second one was Michael. Or the other way around. The no, second one was Michael. And they came in and helped out Daniel. And they gave him new strength. So there are these examples. I mean, I think of Second Kings chapter 6. And there's Elisha, and he's got his servant, Gehazi, there. And, 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 and there's these, this massive you know, force of military coming down the hill. And Gehazi's knees are shaking, and uh, Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes to see that there are more of us than there are of them. Those are the angels, hosts of them, hosts of them that are there. May the Lord open our eyes as we think about this motivation for how to live with one another. That your brother and your sister have these angels and there are more of them than we actually realize. All the angels, in fact, because Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says, all angels, are they not all ministering spirits? to serve those who will inherit salvation. So yeah, and Jesus says they are their angels. You know, not, a, not one guardian angel for you, one for me, one for him. No, all the angels are all the time in every place tending to all the needs of all of us. That's the idea. It's glorious. It's, it's, it's something that we really need to stop and think about as we think about living together as siblings in the kingdom of God as in the family and the household of God. And to think that, hey, you know, we are being cared for by these angels. They are gazing upon the face of our Father. And, yeah, consciously view each other in that way. And, uh, yeah, we will, it, will, it will change us quite dramatically. I mean, think about, you know, that, that royal person, maybe a prince or something, Prince Andrew or whoever these guys are, and he's there sitting on the beach in his, in his swimming costume and he's got basically slops on his feet and there's nobody around, just him in the middle of the sand. And you think like, oh, just another jerk, you know. But then see him coming down that, you know, Buckingham Palace stretch there with all these, you know, regiments of royal guard around him. And he's, this guy, the guy becomes somebody more special. You know what I'm saying? That's the picture we should get of each other. 
we, 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 are, we are surrounded by, you know, a whole regiment of hosts of angels caring for us. And so it changes the picture we have of each other. Jesus is motivating us here. Not just that we would not look down, but that we would look out for one another. Because that's how his angels, his ministering spirits, are busy with me personally, first of all, and with everyone else who's in the family. A born again, Bible believing, blood bought, heaven bound believer. That's how they are towards us. They're taking care of me and you personally, like that. Now, I don't want to get in their way. Neither do you. And to say, well, if I'm that loved, and you that loved, then let me love in the same way as that. So, yeah, we'll join arms with the angels in that sense, is what Jesus is motivating us to do. And so, with such supernatural care, you know, what, what unthinking fool is going to then rather resist uh, one, that, that thinking and fall into the temptation of looking down and being rude and indifferent and to treat another person in the body in a way less than the angels are treating them and to instead treat them like the angels is what we're saying. And so that's what we see Jesus talking about first. But there's a second motivation here. Not just the care of the angels, as we've seen. But, yeah, there's somebody far more important, like Hebrews 1 says, yeah, as superior to the angels as the name he's inherited. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. So, motivation number two. Not just the care of the angels, but the love of Christ. We read that in verse 12 and 13. Now let's read that. And, and notice we're leaving out verse 11 this morning because although you might find it there, I find it in a footnote at the bottom of my page in my text, it doesn't belong here. There's a well-meaning scribe who put it there when he said, the Son of Man came to seek and save that was lost. We do find that in the Bible. It's not a false statement, but it doesn't belong here. It belongs in Luke chapter 19 in the story of Zacchaeus, who was a typical one who Jesus came to seek and save, a lost one. But we're going to take our text. We'll take from that, though, because what, what that person who put that in there assumed is that this, this shepherd in the little analogy was Jesus who came to seek out this lost sheep. So he put that in there by, you know, I think just kind of like wrong, wrongly. But yes, the love of Christ is seen here and displayed here in the love of the shepherd. The shepherd as the Son of Man. And so, yeah, let's have a look at this. Straight on, really, from then verse 10 to verse 12 to 13. What do you think, Jesus says, if you ha one of you has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go and look for the one that has wandered off? And when he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. So there we see Jesus giving this second reason, the second motivation. And it's this, the love of the shepherd for the sheep. It's a beautiful picture that he gives us. So it's, it's a common one in scripture that we are familiar with and even know quite a bit about, I'm sure. I mean, we, Tracy and I, uh, you know, spend a lot of our time in ministering there in the Transkai. And it's amongst a very agrarian society and community and everybody's got sheep and goats and we see every day that, you know, the shepherding is going on there um, with these animals. And uh, Jesus, Jesus you know, we, we've, we've learned a, a lot more than we did know from being there. But uh, Jesus applies this to his relationship with his disciples in this parable. Because it's not difficult for us to understand about this shepherd-sheep relationship. They, they know the shepherd, their flock. And so they know when one goes missing. You know, there, there in the... In the the history of shepherding there in Transkai, you know, the, the, the guys were perhaps not able to count 
as many as a hundred or as many as sheep as they had. They would get, uh, you know, stones. Every time a sheep walked out in the morning, it put the stone in the bag. And then when the sheep come back, you pull the stones out and every sheep goes in, you put the stone in the bag. And then there's a stone or two, maybe one in this case left. Then you know, there's a missing sheep. There's a missing sheep. And the search begins at that point for that missing sheep until that last stone is finally put in the bag as the missing one goes in to the spire, that little that enclosure. So Jesus knows, like a shepherd, intimately and instinctively, his sheep and even when one of them is missing. And it concerns him greatly then uh, because if a sheep goes missing and it goes astray, it becomes a very vulnerable animal. They become easy prey to predator, easy prey to predators, maybe to injury, falling over a precipice, and even to thieves. Sheep are very vulnerable. We know that about them, and a shepherd knows this, and he immediately is alarmed and goes in search for a sheep that goes missing. He doesn't just say, you know, ah, man, it's just one sheep, so it's gone missing. One doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter that it's one. And it doesn't matter which one even goes missing. He doesn't say, ah, it's just that one. No, I'm done with that one. It's always going missing. And write it off as not worth the trouble. He, Jesus, this shepherd, does not show partiality. Who's showing his shepherd-like love to us. I, I only go after the ones I like. No, that doesn't... That doesn't Work like that in Jesus' mind. But, but not that one, no. That's not Jesus. He knows that one that's gone astray. He knows what temptation that sheep is susceptible to. He knows things like perhaps which direction that sheep went in even because it's wandered off in that direction before. And he knows how to go and find that sheep and to rescue that sheep and to even risk his life and his safety to, to do that for that sheep. And all this comes from this beautiful analogy that we see in 12 and 13, yeah, of, you know, that God has given of himself, really, in Scripture as a shepherd of his sheep. Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. He's the good shepherd. He goes out and he fights jackals. He rescues sheep from wherever they've gone and wherever they find, he finds them. And he lifts them like that famous picture of the shepherd carrying the sheep back on his, shoulder, on his shoulders. You know, broken perhaps, bleeding perhaps, but back in the fold again. And obviously Jesus is that great shepherd of the sheep, yes, that we see in this. And he knows us. He knows that our stupidity and in our stupidity we are inclined to wander around, wander away, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, we sing, prone to leave the God I love, we're singing of our experience here, take my heart and seal it, seal it for your courts above. He knows that we like this, and uh, our great shepherd who's able to take constant care of us, his defenseless sheep, and to look out for us as, you know, he says of himself, even in Ezekiel chapter 34, that great chapter about you know, the, the, the God is our shepherd. So I'll, you know, I'll seek out my scattered sheep and deliver them from all the places where they are scattered on a cloudy and dark day. That's our God. That's our God who's looking over his flock, you and I, the one and others, in his church. And he's the good shepherd who does that. So, Back to, you know, our text here now in Matthew 18. The point is this, folks, as we think about this motivation, the second motivation from verse 12 to 13, that obviously Jesus is saying to us, since that is how I take care of my sheep, including you and me, the point is how dare any one of us Look down in contempt on one of these little ones. 
It's completely incongruous, you know, to, you know, for us to show contempt for another instead of care and concern. It would make no sense to do that for us. It does not make sense in the light of what Jesus Christ, our great shepherd, is doing and how he's caring for us. And we need to emulate him, folks, in that way. Perhaps even going after the stray, straying sheep. As in Galatians 6. And you know, we're going to talk a bit about that in the next um, session. As far as bearing one another's burdens. So I won't go there now. But yes, we need to consider how not looking down is to go after one another. Is to go after that one who has stumbled into sin. And sometimes we will not be able to bring that sheep back as we would like, but as far as we can, we need to be like Jesus in that way. And so, yeah, with good reason then, uh, Jesus has been warning us here against the danger of looking down on each other and to rather be taken up with looking out for each other. But we come now to the last verse here, and it's verse 14. And we see a final motivation for us in regard to do not judge, but build one another up. We see one final motivation from our Lord's lips, and it is this. Because of the will of the Father, notice in verse 14, in the same way, in the same way, it's all connected to do not, you know, look down. In the same way, do not look down, but, you know, Look out for, because of this, your Father in heaven is willing, not willing, sorry, that any one of these little ones should perish. Did you see that in verse 14? So the will of the Father, that's our third motivation. We've seen the, you know, the, the care of the angels, we've seen the love of the shepherd that motivates us towards one another, the care of the angels towards one another, the love of the shepherd towards one another, but now the will of the Father towards one another. He's not willing for that. You know, the, he does not want to see a single one come into harm. He wants to see every single one come into harmony. And that was our brother's um, session about living in harmony. Not harming. Harmony. Harmony. He wants to come into harmony. He, he doesn't want to see harm. He doesn't want to see harm. In the same way, in which the angels care and the shepherd cares and serves. So, that, so we're motivated in our oneness by this reminder of our Father being not willing. And the word there, for any one of these little ones to perish. Pick up on that word, perish. Because it's the word, you know, it's, it, it can cover all kinds of destruction, this word. Perish and devastation and harm. Both eternal and temporal. And in, the, in this case, in this context, I believe the, 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 the meaning is a temporal meaning. This is talking about sheep in the shepherd's flock. These are little children in the father's family. And so it's, not a, it's, it's a temporal meaning. It's, a, it's not a permanent meaning. It's a non-permanent kind of a, a meaning of, of damage that comes and defeat that comes. And that happens, folks, like this. When we think about this, that when we despise each other instead of deferring to each other, when we show contempt for each other instead of concern for each other, that will result in a kind of destructive effect upon each other that the Father is not willing for us to fall into. It's not his good, pleasing and perfect will for our lives. And we know what that feels like when that happens, when we are the target of someone else's harm and harmfulness, it causes a fellow believer you, you know, to, to, to fall perhaps into some kind of a discouragement, spiritually get set back by that in his walk, and to even fall into temptation in that discouraged and spiritually set back condition 
to fall into some kind of temptation and sin. And then to you know, reap the Father's heavy hand of chastening in his life. In that sense, we are causing that person to be harmed, to be perished, to perish, to ap- ap- uh, apolumi, this Greek word, to suffer harm and loss. Now when you think of the Apostle Paul for an example of this, when he wrote to those Corinthian believers, you know, he, he wrote from a badly battered and bleeding uh, con- con- condition because they were constantly despising the Apostle. And it's a heart-wrenching thing to see as you read that. And it's a displeasing thing even more than heart-wrenching for us, displeasing to the Father. It's not His will that any should come to that kind of harm uh, from the despising and the disdain and the kind of judging that goes on between uh, Christians sometimes and church people. And so, yeah, if the Father is not willing for that, we should not be willing for that as well. Uh, he, Paul knew that was, not disple- was, was displeasing to God, their behavior, and that's why he wrote to them, told them, you've got to repent from this. You've got to turn from this because it's being harmful to the witness of the church. It's being harmful to my own effectiveness of my ministry. And it's, yeah, displeasing. And so, yeah, though that, despe- that, that despising, you know, displeased God and harmed Paul, God was able to use it for good. And we see that in the apostle's life as well. Yeah, and we see that in the Christian, in the Corinthians, life, that they came, they were people, like we read in 1 Corinthians 11, like Paul says, many of you are even, you know, weak, sick, and some have even fallen asleep for all of this despising that's going on here between you in this situation. So, yeah, no, let's, God doesn't let despisers get off the hook. He's not willing for it, and he will punish. And here's the thing, woe to that one then, who should you know, despise one of God's little ones. That's the point. The motivation here is God's not willing. And because of that, woe to the one who does that. Because you despise the children of God's kingdom, and you're despising the children of the king in that way. Indirectly, you're despising the king himself. Directly, really. We're despising God when we despise at any level one another in the way that Jesus is warning us to. So it's not to judge. It's to build each other up. Let's not be nitpickers. Let's be nurturers of one another. Let's be nurturers of another. God's will is instead of looking down to look out for the needs and the interests of other, like the angels do. We've seen how they do. That's how we need to do it, like loving shepherd does, Jesus Christ. And like the will, Father wills for us to be cared as he dispatches his angels and, you know, directs his good shepherd. And so, yeah, it's a beautiful text, folks, that we see here as we think about our oneness and one another. And, yeah, at the same time, it's a kind of a negative, but I'm trying to make it a positive message as well. Not just look, day day, a re, you know, scathing rebuke to you, but also, you know, a kind of like a supporting kind of reasons for why we should rather be building each other up. And so, yeah, you know, I, 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 it makes me think of the Hebrew writer as we close now and round this off because, you know, in chapter 6, you know, he says, you know, even though I speak like this, beloved, to you, and he's given them some really strong rebukes there in chapter 6, if you know the, cha- the passage. He says, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. And then he says this, God is not unjust. He will not forget you or your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. And so, yeah, you know, I I encourage you like that. As far as as one another, we are building each other up. God is not unjust. He will remember all of that, the help you're giving to each other, 
you will remember that work that you have done. And so, you know, even I say, you know, don't despise each other. I believe better things in your case in that way. But yeah, perhaps the stinging rebuke of this text is a good one for us. So yeah, let's let, not let this little sliver of text in the greater context of chapter 18 be lost on us as far as its implication and its impact this morning. But like Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and verse 1, that beautiful word, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. And that's what we've seen in this text. We are dearly loved children. Let's live a life of love. That's how we need to be. And, you know, uh, when, we, when we are that way, the, then our oneness can thrive. Amen? There will be oneness that can only thrive like that, and that is essentially how Jesus Christ is instructing us to live here, and that is how he was glorified in his church and amongst us. So let's pray. Thank you, Father, for a simple little text this morning and one that even spoke to my own heart deeply as I was pondering it in preparation. And, yeah, thank you that we could share it here this morning. And it, it, may it make a difference in our lives, Lord. Uh, may, it, may it cause us to see one another through different eyes, fresh eyes, eyes that are your eyes, really. And then, you know, truly help each other and serve each other and honor each other and not hinder your will in each other's lives. So thank you for these motivations as to why, Lord. And thank you for your spirit in us. You've poured out love by your Holy Spirit into our hearts by which we can only do these things. And yeah, if there's anyone here, Lord, who who's, hasn't come into the kingdom like a little child, may they cry out for grace and mercy from God through Jesus Christ alone that that may be changed even this day as we listen to your teaching from your word. And we pray, Father, bless the rest of our time now in Jesus' precious name and for your glory. Amen.